Hello, everyone. I'm Kai Liu from Georgetown University. I'd like to first thank Giovanni and other organizers for organizing this uh, workshop. Uh, today, I will be discussing magneto-ionic control of jarzynski maria interactions and the spin textures. Here is the outline of my talk. I will give a brief introduction to magneto-ionics. Uh, then I will primarily illustrate chemisorption induced DMI using oxygen, hydrogen, and the control of spin textures such as domain wall chirality switching, writing, deleting of skirmions. Uh, if time permits, I will discuss briefly uh, potential use of uh, such effects in 3D information storage and also touch upon magneto ionic control of exchange bias. Finally, I will summarize the talk. As we know, electric field control of mechanism has attracted tremendous interest over recent years. Here are just some examples of the seminal works in the field, including using electric field to control Curie temperature of magnetic semiconductors, of metallic ferromagnets, uh, controlling magnetic anisotropy, and magnetic tunnel junctions. Usually, the electronic effects are the predominant ones. On the other hand, uh, ionic motion uh, has been highlighted particularly over the past couple of uh, decades uh, in memristors, where the electrical resistance is dependent on its uh, prior history. And the mechanisms involve uh, sometimes conducting filament formation and breaking, and also uh, ionic uh, transport using oxygen ion or vacancy. And this have led to very exciting uh, potential applications in resistive random access memory, uh, where studies have illustrated, for example, sub nanosecond switching speed. And uh, such memristors also found important applications in artificial neural networks. The magnetic version of this uh, is best illustrated by the seminal work from Dominique Givaud's group where they've shown that using electrolyte and the electric field, the charge accumulation uh, on the exterior side of a material electrostatically induce charge buildup in the interior side of the material. So across this important interface, there is nanoscale electric double layer buildup, uh, which are essentially nanoscale parallel plate capacitors. And this leads to the changes of the carrier concentration and distribution, and in turn modifies the material properties. This review article by Chris Layton nicely illustrates uh, this electrostatic effect. And more recently, there's also been study illustrating the electrochemical effect, where the charge carriers can go into the materials that's being gated. And both of these aspects have been illustrated, for example, by this studies on the metal insulator transition in vanadium oxides. There have also been a number of very nice recent review articles. I will be focusing mostly on solid state magneto ionics, which is essentially atomic scale control of interfaces via ionic motion. The importance is underscored by this famous phrase, the interface is the device. Here, using electrostatic or electrochemical means, the material properties at the interface can be drastically changed. For example, in this uh, earlier studies by Jeff Beach's group and the Wei Gang Wang, Susan Tavelta's groups, they have shown that in gallium oxide cobalt systems, the oxygen ion migration can trigger the toggling of the cobalt perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. And the effect size can be extremely large. Uh, the anisotropy change can be one to two orders of magnitude larger than prior studies. And the electrochemical means further enables the magneto-ionic control over interfaces and beyond. And in essence, magneto-ionics allows one to control all magnetic functionalities in an electric field. And they are intrinsically energy efficient they are also compatible for 3D integration. In the following, I will try to illustrate some examples, mainly on using 
chemisorption to induce DMI and control spin textures in various systems. A key challenge in magneto ionics is that ion transport occurs under buried interfaces. In this uh, elegant study by Jeff Beach's group at MIT, uh, they've recently shown that instead of oxygen ion, they can use hydrogen ion or proton to manipulate the cobalt PMA. And in this example, uh, the proton is driven in an electric field to this important cobalt top interface and reduced to hydrogen atom and trigger the PMA switching. Uh, for us, we are very interested in exploring uh, what happens at this very important interface and uh, quantitatively provide understanding. So we go to a model system of a ferromagnetic uh, surface and introduce controlled amount of oxygen or hydrogen by dissociative, dissociative chemisorption under ultra high vacuum. And we look for induced DMI. As we know, DMI is an important handle to introduce real space topology uh, into spin textures, such as uh, magnetic skirmions and chiral domain walls. And usually uh, the interfacial DMI involves heavy metals due to the strong spin orbit coupling. Our tool for visualizing the real space spin texture is spin polarized low energy electron microscopy, uh, which uses the spin dependent electron reflectivity difference for imaging with a high spatial resolution down to about 10 nanometer. It can also resolve the three components of the magnetization vector. We measure the domain wall spin textures as a function of layer thickness, where the sign and the magnitude of the DMI can be determined by measuring the critical thickness where the domain wall transition from chiral neo wall to a chiral, uh, as shown in this uh, recent study, which uh, discusses the induced DMI in the ferromagnetic graphene system. So for our study, we first establish a tunable DMI system where we can achieve a clean platform with zero DMI. Uh, the platform is nickel cobalt palladium tungsten multilayer, where palladium and the tungsten have opposite DMI. So by choosing the palladium thickness just right, we can tune to have essentially zero DMI. For example, as illustrated here, uh, with initially 2.1 monolayer of a palladium, uh, we are on one side of this tipping point where the domain walls are right-handed. And the image shows that in the black region, the, the magnetization is pointing up or out of the screen. The gray region, the magnetization is pointing down or into the screen. And along this domain wall, the magnetization is pointing from black to gray. And it's illustrated uh, in this cartoon. If we follow the adjacent spin, they form this uh, clockwise winding configuration or right-handed chiral neo wall. If we increase the palladium thickness to 2.9 monolayer, we see the exact opposite. Now the arrows are all pointing from gray to black. Okay, and adjacent spin now winds in a counterclockwise fashion corresponding to a left-handed neo. And this is a result of the increased palladium thickness. So in between around 2.46 monolay of a palladium, we have a chiral domain wall where the two balance. So this gives a clean platform uh, to look at the effect of the chemisorption induced DMI. So here we start with a sample that has 2.76 monolay of a palladium. And this is on the thicker side of the zero DMI tipping point. Uh, with uh, initially left-handed neo wall. And the movie shows the contrast change. Initially, uh, the contrast is that the white at the bottom, black on the top. As we introduce oxygen coverage, we see the contrast exactly flips. Okay, And so this corresponding to the chirality switching from the initially left-handed neo to right-handed neo. And this is a recap of that uh, movie. Uh, as a function of the different oxygen coverage, uh, we see the evolution uh, from left-handed neo to right-handed neo. And 
Uh, this histogram uh, plots the angle uh, between the magnetization along the domain wall with the domain wall normal. So this plot corresponding to palladium thickness of 2.76, which is this green curve. If we start with different palladium thickness, we see this transition happen at a different oxygen coverage. For example, if initially the uh, palladium thickness is thinner, uh, then it takes less oxygen to uh, switch the chirality. If we have thicker palladium, then it takes more oxygen to complete this transition. So from this, we can arrive at a phase diagram uh, in terms of the palladium and thickness and the oxygen coverage. And so it takes, uh, if we look at this boundary, it takes uh, roughly uh, 0.24 monolayer of, of uh, oxygen coverage to compensate the effect of 0.37 monolayer of a palladium. And from there, we can extract quantitatively the DMI to be about 0.63 milli electron volt per atom for one monolayer of uh, oxygen coverage. And this value is actually quite significant, uh, comparable to values obtained in uh, ferromagnetic transition metal systems. And here we show the result all done by the SPLIM experiments to be consistent. And this uh, oxygen induced DMI is uh, quite large comparing to other uh, transition metal systems. And in this case, the origin of the induced DMI is the electric surface dipole moment induced by charge transfer because of the differences in the electronegativity uh, between oxygen and the ferromagnet. So now the induced DMI gave us, us a handle to manipulate spin textures. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, using oxygen coverage to change the winding number of a bubble domain uh, to a skirmia. Uh, again, we start with this uh, platform uh, and we can see the contrast uh, changes uh, as we increase the oxygen coverage. Uh, here, the shape of the bubble domain change, that's because of the uh, oxygen chemisorption induced anisotropy change. If we look at this uh, uh, as a, at a different oxygen coverage, uh, we see that initially without oxygen coverage, uh, we have left-handed new wall. As we increase the oxygen coverage, we go through a state where the domain is achiral. So this is a topologically trivial bubble. And eventually with more oxygen coverage, it goes into a right-handed skirmia. And this is all done at room temperature uh, without any magnetic field. And in this system, we have a weak residual uniaxial anisotropy. So we see the moments are slightly tilted. Uh, we've also tested this in a second system of a cobalt nickel multilayer stack on top of a copper. And this system gets rid of that uh, weak residual uniaxial anisotropy and also removes the palladium. And we again see that uh, with increasing oxygen coverage, uh, there is a, a systematic change. It goes from a chiral new wall uh, without any oxygen to eventually chiral block wall. Uh, so this shows that the oxygen chemisorption induced DMI is a robust effect, and this can be used uh, to manipulate spin textures. And next, let me discuss the hydrogen system. And so we've explored a similar effect in the uh, using the lightest element hydrogen, uh, still use the same platform of a nickel cobalt palladium tungsten. Uh, as we introduce uh, hydrogen, uh, this is again done in ultra high vacuum. We introduce a, a sub monolayer of a hydrogen, about 0.6 monolayer. Uh, when we introduce, uh, before we introduce hydrogen, uh, this domain wall is left handed anew. And this is again shown by this uh, histogram. And after we introduce the hydrogen, we see uh, much part of the domain wall switch to right handed anew. And this uh, video clip shows the contrast change of the domain wall from black to white uh, before and after the hydrogen exposure. And uh, we can again quantify the hydrogen induced DMI. Uh, in this uh, system, 
uh, by changing the palladium thickness, we are able to change the effective BMI strength. Uh, as shown in this diagram, we see that over a very narrow palladium thickness uh, variation, uh, the presence of uh, hydrogen is able to switch the chirality. So we can again link the amount of a hydrogen contribution on the DMI to the amount of a palladium contribution on the DMI and extract the hydrogen induced DMI uh, to be about 0.01 milli electron volt per atom. Uh, and here are references uh, for other elements, again, done by the SPLIM experiment. And we know that in the hydrogen system, the induced DMI is uh, much smaller than the oxygen case. And uh, this actually give us a gentle handle uh, to dial up the DMI using hydrogen. The hydrogen induced DMI is also studied by uh, density functional theory calculations uh, by uh, Stefan Blugos group. Uh, and we find that without uh, hydrogen, the zero effective DMI uh, is around one monolayer of a palladium. And adding one monolayer of a hydrogen uh, on nickel 111, we find that the DMI strength is reduced and hydrogen acts like an additional contribution favoring the right-handedness and thus requiring a larger palladium thickness to reach the A chiral point. And this feature is consistent with the experimental result. So now we use this effect to uh, toggle the domain wall chirality. Uh, on the left-hand side, we show the uh, work function change uh, as we turn on and off the hydrogen. Uh, and so uh, uh, this uh, tracks the coverage of the hydrogen on top of the ferromagnetic surface. And this series of uh, images shows uh, the as grown state in the domain wall is primarily left-handed. As we turn on hydrogen, uh, it switch to right-handed. As we turn it off and on again, uh, and we repeat this a few times, we see this uh, chirality switching uh, back and forth. And this is uh, further illustrated uh, in this plot. <laughs> so uh, this, uh, give us a uh, not only reversible switching, but also a sensitive switch uh, of the domain wall chirality using the hydrogen chemisorption and the desorption angle. Uh, we want to emphasize that the nature of the chemisorption, uh, this is different from some of the earlier studies which involves absorption, where the hydrogen goes into the material. Here, hydrogen chemisorbs or adsorbs on top of the sample surface without penetrating into the layer. So this intrinsically uh, is reversible. And this effect can be integrated with uh, hydrogen-based uh, solid state magnetoionic devices, uh, for example, to tailor domain walls. And I will discuss this more later in a few slides. And our recent a most recent study is to use this uh, chemisorption effect to write and delete skirmia. Uh, so uh, again, using the same nickel cobalt palladium tungsten platform, uh, we find that uh, uh, in the S grown state, uh, by choosing the thickness of the layers right, uh, we have uh, perpendicularly magnetized layers where the blue and the red region represent magnetization pointing up or down respectively. As we introduce a sub monolayer of a hydrogen, uh, we see the perpendicular magnet magnetic anisotropy switches to in-plane. For example, at this state, the contrast disappears, indicating the magnetization has switched to in-plane. And when we turn off the hydrogen, it switches back. Okay, and this is uh, illustrated in this video. It goes uh, in-plane and then comes back. And interestingly, this is the same effect uh, in the uh, solid state magnetoionic system using proton to toggle PMA. Uh, here we can see this effect directly uh, instead of uh, using uh, magnetometry to probe the switching indirectly. We see the effect and we can also quantify uh, how much hydrogen is needed to uh, toggle the PMA. And in this case, it's less than one monolayer. And this uh, chemisorption induced anisotropy 
uh, allow us to also write and delete skirmions at room temperature. And so uh, in certain part of the s grown state, uh, as we introduce hydrogen, we see bubble doming appearing. And after close examination using uh, spleen, and we find that this bubble domains are actually skirmions. Uh, and this is illustrated uh, by this uh, histogram of this alpha angle again. Uh, and this uh, uh, arrows array uh, plot shows that the moment uh, of this uh, bubble uh, is pointing up in the middle and pointing down uh, on the outside and in between it forms this uh, winding configuration. And this is a left-handed uh, uh, new skirmia. And here we show the reversible writing and deleting of a skirmion at room temperature. Uh, start with s grown region. Uh, as we turn on hydrogen, skirmions nucleate. And when we turn off hydrogen, uh, skirmions are deleted. Uh, and this is repeated a few times. Uh, if we follow this uh, three skirmions uh, highlighted by the bubbles, we can see the time sequence uh, when the skirmions uh, in the ferromagnetic state or in the skirmion state. And this uh, video uh, shows one such cycle and now the skirmion will begin to appear uh, with hydrogen on and then they will disappear when we pump away the hydrogen. And again, to emphasize that this is all done at room temperature, just using hydrogen chemisorption and desorption. And it's using the anisotropy change effect. Uh, and the writing and deleting of skirmion uh, is done without using any electric or magnetic field or electric current. And uh, the next few minutes, I will illustrate the potential of this in 3D uh, information storage. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, excitement, for example, uh, in 3D racetrack memory, uh, which involves numerous uh, spin textures such as uh, chiral domain walls or magnetic skirmions. And uh, it is actually very challenging to try to address such uh, spin textures individually, especially in the 3D assembly. And the chemisorption angle potentially is uh, very attractive because uh, it can offer a contactless way uh, to switch uh, or manipulate spin textures, uh, such as switching the domain wall chirality as we illustrated earlier. And furthermore, uh, this effect can be readily integrated with uh, solid state magneto ionic devices. Uh, for example, uh, next to a ferro layer, we could have a reservoir layer that contains the magnetic ionic species. And then uh, this species can be driven, uh, for example, in an electric field uh, into contact with the surface of the ferromagnet, where the chemisorption effect can occur. And for example, induce the DMI, uh, manipulate spin texture, and so on. And so this is a, a very interesting area that we are exploring. We've also uh, done prototype studies to look at uh, 3D structures. And this is uh, uh, done in networks of magnetic nanowires. Uh, we prepare such networks by nuclear track etching using multiple angles. And so the energetic ions uh, are used to uh, irradiate uh, polycarbonate membrane and then uh, they leave behind damaged tracks, which can be etched out uh, preferentially. And afterwards, we use electrochemical deposition to fill up such nanopores and leading to interconnected nanowire networks. And they are self-supporting uh, and freestanding. So here are examples. Uh, the top one shows uh, five angle tracked networks. Uh, the bottom one shows the uh, three angle tracked uh, Kobo networks, uh, which we use to illustrate uh, the principle of uh, uh, information storage in such networks. So we studied magnetization reversal in such networks using first order reversal curves. Uh, we've captured details of the magnetization reversal. Uh, the, the, the plots themselves are pretty complicated, so I won't go into great detail, uh, except to point out that uh, for example, we've measured 
the networks in different geometries uh, with magnetic field parallel to ir ir irradiation plane. Uh, the top one shows just parallel nanowires without any intersection. The bottom one shows the three angle track networks uh, under different geometry. And there is such evolution. For the, this case illustrate a demagnetizing dipolar interaction. Uh, this vertical ridge is characteristic of such effects. And then in the network case, we see additional uh, magnetization reversal mechanisms uh, involving uh, intersection mediated domain wall pinning and propagation, and eventually to shape anisotropy dominated uh, magnetization reversal. And there are potentials of using such networks for information storage. For example, by varying the magnetic field strength and orientation, we can selectively address a certain set of the nanowires, uh, such as uh, the ones highlighted in red. Uh, initially, this uh, wires perpendicular to the membrane can be uh, magnetized into single domain state. And then by magnetic field sequence, uh, we can propagate such a magnetic state through the network. Uh, we have also found interesting magnetotransport signatures uh, showing the effect of pinging by the intersections. And there are potentials of using such intersecting uh, networks for multi-state memristors. Uh, on an interesting side angle, uh, we've explored using nanowires to build nanoporous foams. Uh, disordered met, uh, metal foams, and they are uh, very uh, lightweight. They have very high surface areas, uh, also mechanically robust. We've actually used them as uh, highly efficient filters for deep submicron particulate filtration. And this is highly relevant uh, for uh, combating COVID-19 and air pollution, uh, because it is a particularly challenging to filter out deep submicron particulates. Uh, our uh, design actually was uh, recognized by a recent Barter NIOSH mask innovation challenge. Uh, and also there's potential uh, connections of using such a foams uh, for air emission control. And lastly, I just want to touch upon briefly uh, the exchange bias angle. Uh, there's a lot of interest in using electric switching of uh, exchange bias. And this is uh, very important because exchange bias is at the heart of numerous uh, spin valve devices, such as magnetic tunnel junctions. Uh, and there have been studies, for example, uh, using uh, magnetoelectric effects, you know, multifluoics, uh, and memristors to try to use, uh, uh, try to achieve electric switching of exchange bias. Uh, in magnetoionics, we have previously explored uh, ferrimagnetic galenium iron and uh, nickel cobalt oxide, uh, which uh, leads to manipulation of uh, exchange bias through the magnetoionic effect. We've recently studied another system of galenium nickel cobalt oxide, which at room temperature, neither of these components are ferromagnetic. But because of the interfacial redox reaction, uh, we can induce an exchange bias effect. And furthermore, we can enhance that under an electric field. And this can enhance the exchange bias by up to 35%. And this can be reset uh, by a field cooling. And uh, uh, we have done microstructural characterizations using STEM and EOS, also polarized neutron reflectometry. Uh, this shows that under the electric field gating, uh, we not only induce an interfacial uh, nickel cobalt layer, but also there's a, a galenium nickel alloying effect. And we're also modifying uh, the interfacial uh, concentration of the pinned uh, uncompensated spins. And all of this effect leads to the enhancement of exchange bias. Uh, these are also complementary to other efforts using magnetoionics to explore exchange bias, including uh, Karin Leisner's group using electrolyte and Jeff Beecher's group uh, using ferry magnets. So to summarize, we've demonstrated a variety of uh, functionalities uh, that can be magnetoionically controlled and also understand of their uh, mechanisms. 
And one major effort is the chemisorption angle, which uh, includes uh, induced DMI and uh, chirality switching of the domain walls, writing, deleting of uh, skirmions. Uh, another angle is the exchange bias, uh, which can be used, uh, uh, the electric field can be used to enhance and tune the exchange bias. And this also offer a number of device possibilities by using electric fuel gating uh, in 2D and 3D. Uh, we've demonstrated uh, the possibilities using a prototype 3D networks. Finally, let me uh, acknowledge the people who actually did the work. Much of what I've shown were led by Dr. Gong Chen, along with uh, Alberto Quintana, Chris Jensen at Georgetown, and my graduate students, uh, former graduate student Peyton Murray and current graduate student uh, Mac Robertson at UC Davis. Uh, we've also been fortunate with uh, uh, great collaborators, including the Neutron Group, uh, Julie Borges, Alex Gruter, Patrick Quarterman, Brian Kirby, and NIST, and Magnetic Imaging with Andrea Schmidt uh, at uh, LBL and his group, uh, Robbie LaConte, Roland Wiesendanger at Hamburg, uh, Stefan Bluger's group at Eulish, uh, Xishan Zhang's group at uh, KAUST, uh, and also uh, other colleagues at Complutense, uh, University Autonomous of Madrid, Nanjing, and uh, Kwanghee University. Uh, with that, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.